Well, about a year ago, we put a challenge to Pit Fulun and Magnus Haystek. It's a five-year challenge. It was a million rand that one of our community members, a member of our tribe, put up, gave half a million to Pit, half a million to Magnus, and uh, one year in, there's only one horse in the race. There was only one horse in the race six months ago, but now it's it's got even more exaggerated. I'm sure Magnus Haystick is saying he's just biding his time. But Pitt, you the man out in front. Now your half a million is now worth 550,000 Rand. And Pitt, uh, Magnus, rather, your half a million um, on the 2nd of November anyway, and the one year anniversary was worth 365,000 Rand. So let's allow the leader to have the first say. Look, it's, uh, as I think it is an nice word to say the Curry Cup isn't won in May. So one has to be very cautious about that. Um, so I, I, I do think that one has to frame this debate, very interesting debate, correctly. Uh, and the way I see it, it's not an either-or debate. Do you have all your investments in South Africa or do you have all your investments offshore? It is more a debate around how much to have in South Africa and how much to have offshore. Uh, that's the thing we need to think about. And my argument for the past two years has been and continues to be that whatever your neutral allocation is to South Africa, if that's naught, then you should have maybe 5 or 10% South Africa now. Or if it's 50%, then maybe you should have 60 or 70% South Africa now. So whatever each person's own individual benchmark is, if I can put it that way, your neutral position, you should have more in South Africa right now uh, because assets are so cheap and undervalued here for a variety of reasons, which we can go into a bit later. And I must thank you. Uh, give credit where it's due. We changed the business portfolio on the strength of your recommendations, added in value stocks and South African stocks, a lot of South African stocks. In fact, we've got 50% of the portfolio now in SA Inc. And that has helped us a great deal from uh, my, my well, exponential no. shares that haven't done so well. That's the whole thing about diversification. I, you know, you don't know what the future holds. Just like we sit here in South Africa, it's a tough environment, it's hard, um, but assets are priced quite cheaply. You don't know what the future holds. It could get a lot worse, and it probably will get a lot worse. It might get a lot worse than assets are actually anticipating, and then South Africa won't be such a great investment. So that is a possible outcome. That, but a diversified portfolio helps you navigate the future with confidence because you have exposure to different outcomes, not one particular outcome. Magnus, I think Pitt's being very gracious. He's been more than gracious. Hello, Pitt, and hello, Alec. I'm I mean, at, at, the, at the moment, it's, as you say, Pitt is well, well, well ahead. But, you know, as I said, after six months, it was a question of timing, and I had no control over the timing when our uh, business uh, the community member said, yes, the money, it was November last year. It was at the end of a very, very long bull market for global stocks, technology stocks. And in that previous 12 years, there was no question what was the superior asset class. It was it was overseas, especially technology stocks. So, but you you, you play with the hand that you dealt with. And, and, and the community member, whom I know quite well, a uh, very smart guy, and he said, listen, you want to take Pete on? And I said, listen, uh, you know, Peter's is on the top of his game. He's been outperforming everything in sight. But um, be that as it may, let me have a go. And um, I stuck. I had no choice. I can only invest in offshore assets. My fault, perhaps, was I stuck to the technology stocks and got badly burnt when the market came down January, February, March. And, uh, you know, I've looked at the portfolio again today. I am making some changes to one of the funds that is really not performing. And, and uh, we're putting in funds like the Randmore Fund that's outperforming, thanks to you, Alec. I had a chat with uh, Sean Pichet, and I like what he's thinking. But I am still overweight on, on technology stocks. And while it's burning me now, it can rapidly um, uh, turn around very quickly. In fact, we have – I saw Fundsmith, you know, that big U.S. Uh, fund – They've got 25% of their assets globally in, in technology. They are buying technology quietly at great levels. They say, uh, Terry Smith lives in Mauritius. I bumped into him. He reckons technology is very cheap. There are other people too. So my bad luck is that I ran into Pete Fillion at the top of his game. 
uh, he and and and, the, and his big call. If you analyze Pitt's fund, and I do use Pitt's fund in our portfolios, thank you very much, Pitt. Um, has been a call mainly on resources. He got the call spot on. If you analyze the last three to five years, the sectors in the South African economy that have outperformed massively was number one resources, and Pitt got it right with Exaro and 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 some gold in there, and 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 the second line of attack was these, these financials that have done well. So if you look at performance year to date, the South African market, you've got two asset classes or two categories of funds. One was resources and the other one was banks and financial services. So so, so Peter is not only thrashing me, he's thrashing all the big brand names. I don't feel too bad. However, <laughs> as Pete says, it's a, it's a fascinating debate and it's amazing how and where in the world I am I meet people and they say ah oh, oh, Peter's really rubbing your, your your face into it and I say it's a five-year game but I've been around Pete's been around Alex you've been around the markets can change very quickly I'm very glad to say and we had a very large webinar last night and uh, and over the last year only two asset classes in the world made money in dollar terms. The one was straightforward cash, US dollars, and the other one was resources. Those are the only two asset classes that made money. And that has not happened like in a hundred years. Bonds killed you, equities killed you, emerging markets killed you. Um, Bitcoin wiped you out. So, and Pete got that call spot on, and that's what his job is. He's a value manager, and well done. I'm not changing the portfolio, in fact, if I was, a, I was a gambling man, I'd buy some more technology, but I don't have much more because I've lost a lot of it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, I, Magnus. I might have to slip in some cash there, but the strategy is the same. Um, yeah. well, well, we don't have I'm technology sure. in South Africa. We have, it's an asset class that we do not have, and we haven't had it for forever, and, and it has cost investors money. But right now, as that economist uh, C.W. Dukivit said, South Africa progresses by means of political disasters and economic windfalls. And we had an interview, you and I, Alec, about a year and a half ago where we said South Africa got very lucky, very, very lucky that resources kicked in. It's generating massive profits, despite the fact that the volumes of exports have gone down because the ports can't handle the, the volumes and the railways can't handle it. We have still generated a great deal of profit not only for the individual shareholders, but also for the tax man and indirectly South Africa. So, yes, that's the game. It's resources versus technology, and it's quite a fascinating challenge. Yeah, you can just imagine. I like to look at things always as a glass half full, and you can imagine if Transnet gets its act together with help from third-party private sector operators uh, at the – a medium-term budget speech in the press conference, uh, the finance minister, Enoch Gondwana, said that Transnet has got capacity for 82 million tons a year of coal. He was just using it as an example. But because of the poor management of the system, they only ma they were only able to get 50 million tons to the harbors. Now, you think if they can get 80 million tons, my goodness, what a difference we would see. But Pitt, if, you, if we were to look at the numbers today, as of today, I'm sure you'd look even better because in the last month, the resources shares have just gone gangbusters. What's been going on there? Yeah, look, I mean, the last month is a very short period of time. They were quite weak before that. So I think they've just played a bit of catch up um, in terms of that. So that's a very short term movement. I, I can't really explain that. But, I, you know, my view on South Africa is grounded in my view on the global capital cycle, uh, which is about a 10 to 15 year cycle. And for the last 10 to 15 years, basically since the global financial crisis, we have gone through a period where capital has flown to financial assets, venture capital, private equity, leveraged assets, you know, and especially in the West where capital is free, interest rates were at zero and, and negative in Europe. So capital is free and, you know, you could do anything and make money. Uh, and I think asset prices got out of whack because of the free capital situation. On the other hand, you've had emerging markets like Brazil, like Mexico, like South Africa, like Russia, and others where capital was very expensive, where interest rates were uh, high. Um, so capital has 
been allocated quite rationally in those environments. Um, and capital has been scarce. And what do these markets have in common? They produce commodities. So capital has not gone into the expansion of productive capacity in commodity producing countries. Whether it's transnet capacity, whether it's Brazil's oil capacity, whether it's Mexico's uh, capacity to manufacture things, all those situations have been starved of capital. And as the world shifts towards onshoring supply chains, towards rebuilding energy, uh, energy not only transmission, but also energy uh, uh, generation uh, assets, all those things use commodities at quite a high level. And all those things are, those commodities are produced in emerging markets. So I think we're moving into a cycle where capital will be rewarded for being allocated towards geographies and assets that produce things, that make things, as opposed to financial assets, which has been the last 12 to 15 years. Uh, so that's a backdrop to my view on South Africa. Um, it's not because I've got rose tinted glasses on and I love the country and I think uh, therefore I ignore all the bad stuff. There's lots of bad stuff out there, uh, too much in fact. Um, but I think there's a broad capital cycle at play in the world right now and South Africa is a beneficiary of that. It's quite interesting, Pitt, uh, before we ask Magnus about Sean Pesh because he's very much in your line of thinking as well, but yeah. uh, obviously yeah. in a global sense. Uh, the whole blow-up of FTX and Sam Bankman Fried, who's Free. now uh, <laughs> Freed Fried, he's, <laughs> who's, who's become very famous, but he was one of the flag bearers for the anti pit Fillion Club. In other words, the yeah. ESG. Yeah. Uh, he was he was out yeah. there saying yeah. that he wants to make lots of money so that he can do good and, and yeah. the ESG yeah. was very, very much uh, a, a, yeah. a, a, something that he believed in. Yeah. Do you think that sobriety is now going to start coming into investment uh, advisors, or in, not just advisors, but investment analysts because of the way that ESG, not just from with him, but elsewhere, has underperformed? I, I, I really hope so, because when, when capital allocators and smart investors like Sequoia Capital fund a business like FTX run by a 29 year old wearing shorts and tackies and making no sense at all when you listen to him speak. Uh, that's just a sign that the world's gone crazy. It's, it's greed and a writ large. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, they all say when you throw a hand grenade in the water, um, the big fish floats up to the surface last. Maybe this is one of those bigger fish uh, that is floating up to the surface of the water into which high interest rates have been thrown. Um, but I don't think so. I think there's more to come uh, on that side of the ledger, the financialized, financialized side of the ledger. I think there's, there's probably more to come. Um, I think this whole venture capital environment, uh, private equity, uh, tech investing, uh, capital is too cheap and the prices paid were too high. And because capital is so cheap, it got wasted on a lot of things. And I think there's a lot still that needs, a lot of water that still needs to flow into the ocean in that specific river uh, before one can say it's water. So you wouldn't agree with uh, what Anthony Ginsburg said, or indeed what Terry Smith is now saying, that the tech shares have had their, have had their hit. Uh, they're going to start rebounding. Uh, you know, I, uh, according to my worldview, the way I read the world, um, I'd be surprised. I, I, I think, you know, just uh, take an example. Tech makes up 25% of the MBCI world. Oil, the oil and energy sector makes up 4% of the MSCI world by market capitalization. The world runs on oil. It runs on oil. Uh, and the tech uh, market is, the competition is huge. Uh, marginal pressure, there's layoffs happening. Um, I think that weight's just too big. Uh, it's just gotten too big. And the energy and commodity side of things has just gotten far too small, you know, for uh, to create a balanced portfolio and for, to reflect on how the world actually works. So it's quite interesting in the conversation I was having with uh, Stafford Marcy yesterday about Bitcoin, and he remains a Bitcoin maximalist. He said that, okay, so FTX has blown up and Bitcoin has dropped, but just contrast that with the market cap loss by Meta, 
And thank heavens, uh, Stafford told us at the last business conference that he didn't like Meta at all, and we dumped <laughs> it out the portfolio before the big smash. Magnus, uh, you're going to be talking at the next portfolio alongside Pitt and Sean, uh, sorry, the next uh, Biz News conference at, at the end of February and uh, uh, Sean Pesh. What is it about Sean that's that's uh, attracting you now, given that he is not really uh, a, well, certainly he's not a fan of tech shares. He's very much a value investor like Pitt is. There are many reasons why I like Sean uh, and, and before I mean, obviously, you, uh, uh, Alec, introduced Sean into the local investment community as a, a fairly uh, straightforward talker, which I like. You, you know, uh, let's 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 call a spade a spade. There's a lot of bullshit in the investment industry. Lot is marketing. <laughs> lot is hype. Lot is, you know. So so, having been in the business for such a long time, it was refreshing to meet guys. We have an opinion, and the opinion is based on their analysis, and they're not afraid to call it out as they see it. And a guy like Pete is definitely in the same camp, and they're not always right, but I like that honesty. Whereas in the investment world, it is, you know, maybe this and maybe that, and, you know, they, they, they all talk the same kind of, you know, um, to try and duplicate the markets and the governments and their clients and their shareholders all at the same time. And you can see it in the results of these large behemoth companies who all they're trying to do is, is, is they just they talk rubbish from morning to night so light short so i pick up the phone i i phone him up and i said let's talk how do you invest money what do you do when you get up in the morning how do you think and we had a very long discussion and we took it further and i said do you mind talking to all of our advisors at Brentest? and there's 25 of them and he said with pleasure and he said he gave an hour of his time to take our advisors through his process. He answered all their critical questions, and Peter's done the same. And and after that, that guy said, I understand Sean Pesh's way of thinking and investing. They can now comfortably include him in a portfolio or not. Whereas when you talk about these very, very large aggregators of capital they will never ever talk to to anybody. They're just above everybody. They've got their view and then take it or leave it. And I like that. And I had another discussion with Sean again this weekend. I just like the way he is honest. He's not as scared to rattle the cages as he's done in South Africa, rightly or wrongly. And I think the industry needs a little bit more of that. A little bit of straight, honest shooting from commentators saying, this asset class is rubbish. Don't invest in it. Like, for instance, uh, Listed property comes to mind. I mean, we haven't touched listed property in five years. It's been a disaster. And every now and then you have some advisor, uh, fund manager coming up and saying, well, maybe now is the time to buy. And you can just see the sales-driven initiative. It's not what the, in the investors deserve. They deserve some honesty. And I think that's the bottom line of, of a guy like Pet and Sean. And there are a couple of others as well. Uh, Evan Walker from 361. They, they, they give you an honest opinion, whether you like it or not, and what you do with it, and, and investors like that. Uh, just to close off with, guys, before we say goodbye, we one year into a five-year event. In the next year, are you seeing more of the same of what we're seeing at the moment, or how how are you, on the balance of probabilities, likely to see the, the next 12 months um, rolling out, Pitt? So I think my view will probably get tested over the next 12 months. If we go into a recession, which seems to be more and more likely as time goes by, um, I think my view will get tested uh, over that 12-month time period. Uh, but on a four-year view from here on out, I'm still confident that, uh, you know, you know we, one gets to the other side of the recession and there's still no supply response from the commodity producers and the world just grows inexorably. And the demand of commodities grows inexorably. Every year, 2 to 3%. You go through a recession, a recession, it grows by 1 to 2%. Uh, and then you come out of the recession, it grows by 2, 3, 4%. But there's no supply response. And, and that's the foundation for my view is the capital cycle. There, there's a scarcity of capital in certain assets and certain geographies. And the capital that will, that is there and will be allocated to those geographies and assets will be well rewarded over the next four years. 
But I think over the time, next 12 months, there's a good chance my view gets tested. Magnus? The difference between Pitt, who's a fund manager, and myself, who's a financial advisor, is, 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 is that I cannot go and put all my clients' money in one fund because I like the fund or his strategy or it's working right now and I bet everything on his horse and let's hope he wins. I cannot do that. I have to diversify. And that's what clients require of you. I mean, a year or two from now, we can say, geez, the resources have taken a smack and um, the technology have made a, a, a very nice uh, return to performance. That's what diversification is all about. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I, it doesn't concern me that I'm not b- uh, uh, matching Pete's performance at the moment because I'm diversified. I, I'm, I'm, I'm investing in other parts of the world, in other asset classes that have other cycles driving them, and that is what diversification is all about. If you think you're going to spot the top asset class of fund manager and stick to him day in and day out, you are on a hiding next to nothing. We've seen it where, where, where someone builds a massive reputation like uh, the lady from Ock who's lost, they lost you 60 or 70 percent. And, you know, an advisor cannot do that. So I have to build a globally diversified portfolio. Yeah. We're already making changes, we're including some value stocks in there. If resources keeps on running and it's fact driven, I will start putting in global resource funds into that portfolio. But um, I'm not ready to pull the trigger as yet. I am seeing a little bit of a stealth, really rally in some technology stocks in the last month or so. There's been some nice movement in markets. Warren Buffett has put a lot of money into semiconductors, for instance, $5 billion. That's the kind of thing that one looks for in the, in the global perspective. But it's fun. I'm enjoying it. Well done, Pete. I'll send you another bottle of red wine that you're going to drink to my... <laughs> I'll, do, I'll, I'll, I'll have to share it with you. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to enjoy that, both of it. Well, we'll see you uh, obviously before, but uh, clearly we will all be together in the Drakensberg on uh, the end at the end of February, beginning of March. Uh, Pitt will be giving his fifth presentation at the BNC Five. Uh, Magnus, it'll be your second one, and then Sean Pesh, who thank you very much, Sean, if you're going to watch this, and I'm sure he will because he's well mentioned. It's like the newspaper. When you get your picture in the newspaper, you like to see it, don't you? Uh, Sean told us at the last conference, I, I, I pushed him and I asked him for his favorite stock that we could add to the business portfolio. And he gave us a company called Core Civic, which runs prisons in the United States. Well, it sounds unlikely, but it has put on 25% for the business portfolio uh, since the last well, conference. So we're looking an forward to they've another got, one. They've got a captive market, Alec. <laughs> yeah. Now, why did I? Why, I'm not surprised that Magnus would give us that. <laughs> well, brilliant, guys. Thanks again for, for participating in this, in this uh, fun challenge our community members uh, still reckons that briarflas will beat any offshore meal uh, at the moment anyway it certainly has yeah. until the next time from pit for Leon of counterpoint magnus haystack of brenthurst and yours truly alec hogg from biznews.com cheerio